So, hello everybody. Uh, thanks for being there and let me talk to this audience. Um, despite I have a German name and I'm French and I'm going to talk in English, <laughs> being in Lisbon is great. <laughs> so, um, thanks for this. So, I'm, I'm, I'm saying I'm not that, you know, I look very young, but I'm not that young. So, I've been in the software industry for about 30 years and I've been through different evolution of the uh, of the IT industry. And I started obviously with the old time of Fortran, Cobol, and mainframes and so on. So I've been through a different generation of the IT industry. So I'm going to talk today about not too much about open source, uh, not too much about Red Hat, but I'm going to talk about the transformation of what we have today, which is the digitalization of the, uh, uh, of the world, of the business, and the IT systems. So I'm going to use a bit of uh, Gartner uh, things. We have worked with Gartner on that. We call that uh, B-Model IT. And um, what, what we said today is that we are in the fourth generation of uh, the um, computing uh, system. You know, if you would be old like me, you would have known, obviously, the first uh, you know, computing systems. And I don't know if some of you remember who was the toughest, the largest competitor, almost number one in the world, of IBM about 30, 35 years ago. It was a company called Control Data with machines called Cyber. You know, probably very few of you know that. Uh, so the world is changing. So we got these monolithic, you know, proprietary systems at the time. And then we went to the microcomputer, you know, with Unix system or VAC system and so on. Then came the PC. And if you look at that, every time there's been a change, uh, you know, for that, there's been a change where uh, it, it drove 15, 20 years later, it has to change the application infrastructure as well. So not only the underlying technical infrastructure has been changing, but you had to redesign, you know, the applications, uh, you know, to run into the systems. So for mainframe terminal 3270, you know, uh, everything running on the mainframe, when you went to Unix microsystem VAX, you need to, you know, recompile, redevelop your application. When you went to client and server type of applications, you had basically to run the server database directly on the machine and you had to redevelop your client, you know, very often on Windows 3.11, you know, uh, work groups on that. And came then after that the web three tier architecture and same thing, in order to benefit from that innovation, you needed to redevelop your application, redesign and modify your application uh, in order to benefit from that. So you had to get the web front end, then you had mid, you know, mid server, mid tier server for web uh, uh, applications, web server applications, and then you get a database server. So we are now in the fourth generation where things are not you know, client server and web tier architecture, we consume IT as a commodity, even, you know, on mobile. You know, everybody is on a tablet, is on a mobile. I've seen everybody over there. So that's what we call the digitalization. And the impact of that is on our daily business. It's not just people at the office doing a banking transaction for you on your demand. It's not you at home on your own computer doing your transaction on the stock market. But it's you in the street or anyone doing that directly with multiple apps, multiple mobile apps, you know, on your tablet or on your iPhone. So these drive major changes in how you're going to design your architecture, how you're going to consume architecture. So that's the third era of IT that we're calling here. And basically, it changed business model. If you take, you know, who is the largest taxi company in the world? Uber. Very well criticized, obviously. Do they own any car? They don't own car. Who is the largest real estate agency in the world? It's Airbnb. Do they own any real estate? They don't own any. Do that change completely the world when you basically drive system, digitalization, you basically change business model. So companies as well will need to adapt their business model to this new era uh, and, uh, and of business, but it means you need to change IT. And for that, you need to get an IT which is much more agile, much more consumable, that address everyone and everybody. So in order to address this digitalization, you know, uh, you need to basically 
treat IT differently than you have been before. And basically, the previous eras that we have got, we needed marathons. People that can run, you know, 42 kilometers in a row, very performance, key people, and you treat projects, you treat your IT as something absolutely reliable, that doesn't break, works all the time, you know, and it long last, long life duration, long life cycle. And, and it's very, very, very important. Now, if you go to the uh, new world, you need sprinters. What's important? You do an event like this, you know, very often you design a mobile app. Every service you put in place, you do a mobile app. Or you do a service on the web, on your application. So you need to go fast, you need agility. You need to change the way you're gonna provide access to the systems, to the applications, to the service. And the problem is that the way the IT was defined before is not bad. It's just that it does not respond to these new needs that you have today for the services. And, and for that, you will need to manage basically traditional mode one IT with these, I would say, marathon runners. And you need to continue to run that. And there will be potentially projects that continue this way. But you will have also to work in a way with new projects, new system that is going to be mode two, that we will require, you know, this agility, this rapidity of developments, this flexible infrastructure, low cost, pay as you go infrastructure. So it's two different goals. So it's not, you know, about fighting one to each other. It's all about how you make them, you know, implemented into your data center, into your company, into your business you know, and how you make them live together. So, Gardner says about 75% of the company will have B-model IT. 50% will make a mess of it. So you need to get prepared. You need to get prepared, you need to make it, you know, in a certain manner that you're gonna be successful for your business and for your company. So, it's basically, it's not a nice to have. It's, you're gonna have it anyway. Because if you try to make the new world of applications, a new world of business with mode one, you're going to be late and non-competitive. Only if you begin from scratch, like a Google, like a Facebook, like a Uber, uh, like an Airbnb, of course, you can start directly with mode two. But most of the company has been there for a long time, and you have to manage the mode one and the mode two. So it's two different approaches that needs to live together, you know? Reliability versus agility. You know, price for performance, revenue, brand, customer experience. You know, waterfall model versus an agile model. You know, like sprint development, you know, sp project management, and so on. Sourcing, very often, very big vendors, you know, traditional vendor can manage that. When you go to mode two, you ne may need to do the choice of taking small vendors, small company, innovators, in order to build that, you need to take that risk. And uh, you need to do a short-term deal because you don't know if what you're building is gonna make a big success for 10 years or it's gonna, just gonna be a success for a few months. And then you will need to change, maybe another vendor, another technology and so on. And uh, you know, it's culture is not IT-centric, it's business-centric. So it's all driven by the user. The user says, I need that, I want that, and I want it now. How you do that when you run an IT and it, it, it must run, it must run the business. So in the cycle of time for doing things is not months, it's days, sometimes hours. So it's two different things. So uh, I read some books uh, about the web giants, you know, these new guys from the last few years that basically has built the model from scratch. So it's great for them because they had no legacy. So when you have no legacy, it's an easy, you know, it's difficult to succeed, but it's an easy way to do new things because you have no choice. Everything is new. So basically, those guys, they basically made everything as a flexible infrastructure. So when you read Facebook, Google, LinkedIn, and so on, they all have a brand new flexible infrastructure based on cloud. You know, they consume IT very easily. They use commodity server, commodity storage, 
uh, uh, open source software and so on. Everything they do as hardware is commodity, it can be you know, for network, can be for storage, can be for computing, it's software defined. It means, why software defined? Because software goes faster. You can innovate, you can modify, you can upgrade software much rapidly than hardware. You know, hardware has a cycle of life which is longer to get designed because it needs to get manufactured. So um, that's one thing. The second thing is that when you focus on the business, the thing is that you need to get the infrastructure to be you know, as flexible and as commodity and as standard as possible. That, that's absolutely a, a key necessity. So if you look at the things today that you have that are absolutely key for your daily life, but that nobody cares, that standard is, you know, it's all standard. You know, take, uh, you know, in IT, what's the most critical applications for everyone? Mail server. It's all about standardization, you know, the, the rest, but you don't want to hear about it. It's like, you know, acoustic and microphone. You don't want to hear about it. <laughs> so um, the other thing is that when you want to develop fast, you need to develop in a different manner. We call that DevOps. And you need to put in place standardization, collaboration, and, and what we call continuous delivery. I will go a bit deeper into that in the way how we, you know, in agility, you can develop on that. So that's what I call the development of pizza team. So you do you know why those guys use pizza team world? Because when you have a pizza, basically a pizza is about, you know, from six to 12 people maximum, depending on the size of the pizza. But uh, <laughs> uh, basically it means that if you want to have agile, quill, a rapid development, don't make your team more than six to 12 people. It doesn't work. You spend, you start to see the curve where you spend more time on having people interactions, correcting problem or others, agreeing with people and so on, you know, than really doing the things. So you need really small team to develop. <coughs> as soon as you reach 12 people, you need to make another team. So it means what? It means you need to split the task of development into micro tasks in order that you keep the team small. Then you have an agility. So that decrease, you know, um, work as feature teams. When I was mentioning the pizza team, uh, I said, you know, you need to work in micro task and you cut them into small tasks in order. But in, before, in mode one, it was more an horizontal approach for development. You had a guy for the network infrastructure, the storage infrastructure. Then you have the database guy. Then you have the middleware guy. Then you have, you know, the app server guy. Then you have the graphical user interface guy. And all those teams, you know, working and they need to interact with each other. The way the web giants develop, they don't develop this way. They develop into a vertical manner. But you take a feature, and basically that feature, you give this small team the responsibility to develop that feature from A to Z. So they're responsible to implement into the database level up to the graphical user, uh, graphical user interface. So they are responsible for that feature. And uh, in order to uh, basically to, uh, to develop that, there are some features like feature flipping um, uh, that I will explain. The, the thing is that when you develop these features, you develop as build, measure, and run. So it means that you develop the feature you make it run, you know, you measure how it, work, it runs. If it runs well, you keep it, you know, and otherwise, you know, you continue, you learn from it, and then you make it better, and you make the new one, and so on. So what's feature flipping? Uh, feature flipping is that when you develop that new feature uh, and that new functionality in the application, you implement it, and it may fail because it's very agile, very rapid, you have not tested everything. You don't know what all the other teams are doing. So you need to plan into your feature that you can deactivate the feature immediately without impacting the application that runs in productions and that is accessible by many, many users. You may have seen that sometimes on some applications or websites that you use an a feature and then you come back maybe one or two days later and the feature is not there anymore. It's because the feature was not really working properly, but the application was still, was still running. 
So feature flipping, it means that you have a flag in the code that basically when you implement the feature, if it doesn't work, you flag it, and it basically doesn't impact the rest of the application, and it deactivates the function till basically it comes back. So this is how you call that continuous delivery. This is how you basically keep the application live and you give the right for failure. And into the mode two, this is something important because if you do things agile, quick, rapid, you need to give you the right for failure. And that's something we're not used to. We want to build a system that is you know, rock solid, that works on every cases, does, does not crash to the impact. Mode two, you need to accept that the, the failure may happen, but you need, you know, the key point is to serve the business and rapidity. So, industry aspiration. Um, everybody wants a, a, a agility today, okay? But nobody wants rigidity, that's for sure. So, however, how you do that? So, what was virtualization? Virtualization was just the optimization of the cost of hardware. If you look at what happened before, it was one application, one or multiple server. Virtualization brought the fact that on one server, you can basically can split it into multiple virtual server, and basically a server that was used maybe 20% of its capacity is now used 80 or 90% of its capacity. But there was no revolution on the way you consume computing. It was just optimizing your infrastructure and the cost of the server. So this is still mode one. Traditional virtualization, Hyper-V, VMware, Red Hat Enterprise Virtualization, KVM, is traditional mode one IT. It's isolated VM on a hardware piece and that's it. There's no you know, auto scaling, all that kind of thing. The mode two, you know, uh, is hyperconvergence, it's DevOps, it's auto scaling, it's big data, you know, and OpenStack authorized that, but it's also um, things like Amazon Web Services, Azure, Google, and so on. And if you look at what you can do with an OpenStack infrastructure, you basically put a layer on top of all those hardware, and you're gonna say, this layer in order to, you know, to run your infrastructure is going to use and maximize the usage with all the applications running on it in order to consume the minimum you know, uh, of capacity of your system. So you may use the peaks and so on, but you can use also outside of your private cloud traditional uh, say, computings on VM from your provider the same way. So how you do that is because this layer that basically create an abstraction, an abstraction completely. <laughs> I break, the, I break the, Thank you for that. <laughs> Party is on. <laughs> you're creating an abstraction layer completely on the physical infrastructure, and basically you're doing software defined on everything in order to really optimize. So, um, and. and as I mentioned at the very beginning, this has a major impact. This has a major impact on how applications are developed. Because if you want to benefit from that infrastructure, you cannot run or you, you cannot benefit with the traditional developed application from such an infrastructure. So it means that if you use traditional applications that run on a VM and you put that into an OpenStack cloud infrastructure, private or public, you know, will not benefit from the auto scaling, all the automation that based on how the applications consume, the infrastructure adapt for that application. You know, is you need to get the application that were what we call stateful application that were used to run on bare metal or on VMs, and you take care of the VM or you take care of the machine, you basically give, you feed the VM or the hardware and the applications to live correctly. What you do then, you farm completely. It means that you put the application on the OpenStack system and you say, go as you need. And the, system, the infrastructure will feed the application by itself from a very large scale. So your application is what we call stateless applications. 
It means that if the application fell on a traditional bare metal or VM, you're in panic. So that's why you're designing high availability systems and so on. On a, on a cloud infrastructure, if you take an application that has been designed as stateless, you put the application, if one of the server of, of the VM you know, fails for that application, nobody cares. It just fell, there is another VM that pops up, run another, another instance of that application, and it just continues to run. <coughs> so this layer authorizes you to get this agility and flexibility to maximize the utilization of your infrastructure. And this is something that is absolutely needed when you go to this digitalization of your business. Because when you start to run appli mobile applications, you have peaks of demands, you know, like when you do a mobile app just for an event, you know, you go to the Red Hat Summit, there is an, an event, and everybody say, where is my next session? So every hour you have a peak of activity, and then you need the system to be able to, to provide that. If you sell cell phone, and you know, it's Christmas time, we know we're buying more cell phone at Christmas as gift, so you need to be able to feed all that stuff. So applications need to be designed this way as well. So it's not just only to modify the infrastructure and say, oh, let's do a cloud, it's a new silo of infrastructure, but it's all about also how are you going to modify your existing applications in order that those applications can benefit from such infrastructure. So it's like when you went to you know, main, main, uh, mainframes or microcomputers to web applications. You had to redesign them. And, and that's the same thing that is happening today. So when people talk about, oh, let's go cloud, and you build this new infrastructure, this is also, you need to redesign applications. So how are you going to redesign that? You need to redesign them, you know, with the agile methodology, and most of them in mode two type of development. So mode one killed mode zero. Mode zero was really main, mainframe, mode one with microcomputer and client server. And mode two, over the time, will kill, kill mode one. But it's going to take, I don't know, another 20, 30 years, so we have time. But this is how things evolve. That's how we renew our work, you know, uh, our employment all the time. But that's technology. So, new generation is always additive. Yes, as mentioned, you know, uh, even if it kills over time, there's always some remaining technology. So I've been in mainframe, I started in mainframe, and it's still mainframe running. A lot of critical you know, workloads. You still have some unique systems. Uh, you still have some client server applications. And, but now you have new applications. When we say it's additive, it means that you are not take, saying, okay, I'm taking my legacy apps and I bring them to the cloud into an agile DevOps you know, cloud infrastructure. What for? If it works well, if it serves well, yes. However, if you want that application to deliver a different service or a new service, you may develop that new service into mode two. So that's the evolution of, of your business that drive what you're going to do. So don't plan about saying, oh, I'm going to take all my systems and put it into mode two and into this new silo. It doesn't make sense. You know, make the new apps, the new services, you know, the new features into mode two when you know, it's justified. So for mode two, one thing important is uh, standardization, as I mentioned. It means that avoid vendor locking. Because the problem is that mode two, as it's very rapid, very new technology, uh, you may have, and you may see a lot of new technology happening. And it means, it means that if you go with you know, traditional vendors, well-established, I would say, from your mode one style, if you start, they all try, to get you in vendor locking. That's the game like every you know, uh, company does. They try to keep customers as much as possible. Software, property software has been a specialist in that. I work in that space. I've been working 15 years in open source, so I know both. You know? And uh, both have good sides and bad sides, but clearly vendor locking is stronger in property software. So open source serve the non-vendor locking on technology. The other thing is that open source serve innovation much faster than proprietary software. And as an example, um, if you take um, the latest new technologies that you have on the market, take, you know, uh, 
team is there. I know Tim is he works for Hotel Works and uh, a, a big data Hadoop platform. What other big data platform from proprietary proprietary software company do you know? Hadoop, you know, uh, is the one that has came up with big companies, you know, and, that, and I haven't seen proprietary software. So one of the virtue, uh, virtuous aspect of open source is that innovation comes faster because you have a lot of people coming into the collaboration and community and they bring that. So in mode two, when we need this agility and that rapidity, also we need innova rapid innovation because you want to use the latest technology to bring that to, you, to that agility. So it's important that to use standardization to use open source software for rapid innovation. Okay. Um, one final thing is that, as I mentioned, you know, when you consume in mode two, you don't know how much time it's going to last. So instead of saying, okay, I'm going to invest on three, five years, and then we're going to see, and so on, you want to make sure before. No, you need to start small, small vendors, and you want to pay as you go. So the traditional model of capital spent, capex, you know, is not very good for that. So it means that I'm making an investment and I do amortization over time. You want to pay by consumption. And, and that's something important into this mode two and digitalization. You basically uh, do more, much more, you know, um, uh, a subscription model, you know, or pay as you go model. So I'm going to accelerate. So first of all, when you go to one to mode two, don't go in the middle. It's the worst thing. So it's like a bridge with you know two sides. If you say I'm going to do a shy, timid model, a little bit of mode two with mode one applications, you're going to fail. So in order to do that, you need to go really one side on another side. And when you go, you know, uh, on the, uh, on that, start with an island project. So in order to say, okay, I don't know how to do that, but I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it a real mode two project, and I start with a small project, you know, and I take it and I do completely. That's recommendation that um, uh, we, we're doing. So start before you are ready. In, in our mind, you say, no, I'm not ready. Start before you're ready. You know, start with, uh, you know, choose an island project. Um, choose... Um, pro you know, protect mode two from mode one bifurcating. So it means that your organization, your mindset, your people will always try to come back to the comfort zone. You know, here we're talking about going into an uncomfort zone. So always people will try always to that. So take the team and, and make sure they're keeping into a mode two model, you know, and they are not bifurcating into the traditional initial uh, model. So uh, mode 2, we learn to integrate with mode 1. So it's not mode 1. Don't ask the people from mode 1 team. To say, oh, you'll need to integrate with mode 2. It's the opposite. You make a mode 2 project, and the mode 2 people will learn how to integrate with mode 1. It's not, you're not going to adapt the big mass to the small things. You will get the small thing to adapt with the big mass. And that's, that's better. And it's going to be more flexible for them to do it. So just to finish, where Red Hat stands with that, because I didn't speak a lot about, uh, about Red Hat in that. Red Hat is obviously an open source company. So we do everything collaborative, everything you know, into a, a community mode. And um, basically, we have been in the cloud uh, solution, infrastructure solution, as well in the application infrastructure solution, even with mobile development applications. And here, you know, IDC says that private and public cloud will grow like hell in the next few years. Public cloud, you know, growing even faster than private cloud. So we are addressing the, the market. And what's the vision of Red Hat? Red Hat today is addressing traditional mode one IT. And basically, we have historically bare metal system running Red Hat Enterprise Linux. We have virtualization. And uh, you can have existing virtualization, which is, you know, obviously VMware, 80% of the market. And we offer, since many years, alternative virtualization, which is Red Hat Enterprise virtualization based on KVM, for which we are the number one contributor. And we obviously are proposing companies to run, you know, like British Airways, to run Red Hat Enterprise virtualization rather than VMware. But it's still mode one. On top of that, 
we have management, life cycle management, cloud orchestration, and so on. And it does manage traditional bare metal machines and traditional virtualization, Microsoft, VMware, <laughs> Red Hat, KVM. But if you want to manage for operations, you know, the traditional, the, the mode two, then we have OpenStack. We are the number one contributor of OpenStack in the community. And we are specifically in all the different modules and projects of OpenStack. And we have developed Red Hat OpenStack platform to build your private cloud or potentially for provider to build this public cloud. And you can basically create your infrastructure based on software defined, you know, uh, 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 network computing and storage based on Red Hat OpenStack, Red Hat storage and so on. So basically you can start to build your infrastructure for these mode two applications uh, with Red Hat software, Red Hat OpenStack platform. Still manage on top by the same orchestration and management layer, which is called CloudForms. Then, you know, BMODIT is there, and you need to consume public cloud. You have local public cloud provider, you have Amazon, you have Google, you have Azure, you have plenty of those. You need basically to get also in the same layer the management of the public cloud providers, because if you build mode two applications, you may build an infrastructure, a flexible infrastructure based on OpenStack for running that, but you may size it into a way that sometimes you need, either for financial reasons or for peaks of activity, you want to use externally. And then you need to have the same vision on your bare metal, your vi traditional virtualization, your private OpenStack cloud, and the public VMs that you have, you know, with the same tool and the same vision. So that's basically what we offer today with cloud forms and Red Hat OpenStack platform and Red Hat Satellite for lifecycle management. It's called Red Hat Cloud Infrastructure. We offer to build that infrastructure with Red Hat. So we even go further. If you want to develop your applications, your new applications of Mode 2, we offer OpenShift. You know, it's a pass platform on which you can do DevOps and in which you can basically develop, use all the open source tools like JBoss, like uh, Rule Engine, like BPMS, like uh, uh, Red Hat Mobile, you know, uh, and you can develop your applications for the mode two on top of those infrastructure. So that's the Red Hat portfolio. You know, we have software defined storage. We have software uh, defined computing with OpenStack. We have the guest OS with Linux, uh, vir traditional virtualization and so on. And, and we do services for that. Thank you.